Good evening. A warm welcome to Wigton Book Festival's Big Bang Week. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Polly Puller, and first I'd like to thank Big Bang funders, the Batchworth Trust and Kilgallioch Community Fund. The books discussed throughout Big Bang are available at the Festival Company online bookshop at bookshop.wigtonbookfestival.com. And questions for today's speakers can either be put in the comments field of the YouTube event or by pressing the question button below the event on the festival website, www.wigtonbookfestival.com. And I'll be asking a selection of these as we go along. Now, as coordinator of the Galloway and Southern Ayrshire Biosphere, Ed Forrest manages the project team and explores new avenues for funding and partnership opportunities while ensuring that the biosphere delivers on its strategic plan. His involvement with the biosphere began in 2011 when he helped to raise awareness amongst local communities, businesses and agencies about the potential that UNESCO biosphere status could offer to Southwest Scotland. As well as working for the biosphere, he's actively involved in developing and promoting nature-based tourism in the region. Joan Mitchell has worked tirelessly to inform public debate in Dumfries and Galloway for over 40 years with community groups in local government, on national and international bodies and in party politics. Now as chair of the Galloway and Southern Ayrshire Biosphere, She's the region's dynamic environmental champion. Incredibly dedicated to the area that she loves so much. She's also a livestock farmer, a true countrywoman who lives and breathes the land and believes that our connection to nature should be at the root of all we do. Tonight, we're going to start with a short film which will give us an excellent overview of the biosphere. And then we'll have a chat together and hopefully then there'll be time for your questions. Thank you. The biosphere basically is, is international recognition of the fantastic wildlife, um, cultural heritage, countryside, the commitment of people in southwest Scotland to sustainability. Really it's quite a unique brand, it's linked into UNESCO and that brand and identity um, is a way of drawing people into the area and really capitalising on those special attributes that we have. It's all about really reconnecting people to their environment and their place, but also seeing its potential for people's economic well-being and their, their personal well-being. The geography is based on river catchments. So we have seven primary rivers that come out of the Galloway Hills, of which the Kendi is one of those river catchments. So coming out right from the core of the area, um, up on Silver Flow, which is one of our designated sites, um, running down through the buffer, which is made up of the Galloway Forest Park, and out through what we call the transition zone, which is where the vast majority of people live and work. Um, and so that really makes up the, this, the Galloway Glens area, running all the way down to Kukubri. We we all ultimately have a dependency on that water and that river catchment really is what dictates the whole area of the biosphere. The biosphere is managed by a partnership board of um, 16 people and, and those people come from a broad cross-section of representation. But I think what gets really exciting is that we actually bring in private business. So we have private business representatives sat on that partnership board. We have landowners and land managers sat on that partnership board. We have community representation there. And ultimately, we're the only forum at which all these different organisations come together across southwest Scotland to actually actively talk about the issues that face us here within the biosphere. We were designated in July 2012. We were the, the first biosphere in Scotland. We're the third biosphere in the UK. Since then, the whole interest in biospheres actually has grown exponentially. So there's now seven biospheres across the whole of the United Kingdom. There's three or four other areas now actively looking at becoming biospheres. 
And, and really one of the big interests for people in, in becoming a biosphere is that they see this connection between people and nature and that whole sustainability story and how that can really sort of bring about an innovative approach to rural development. Ultimately, that's, that's really, I think, one of the, the underlying sort of themes of what we're really about. But the other great thing, it, you're part of a network, you're part of a global network. There are opportunities to learn from other places. So there's over 700 biospheres all around the world and we actively work together learning from each other and seeing how we can benefit. So one of the key objectives of the biosphere is really is to try and facilitate action by bringing together different partners, different organisations, really so that the sum of the parts are greater than the whole. And, and a fantastic example of that really are things like the Galloway Glens. Galloway Glens is extremely useful, I think, to the biosphere as a demonstration of what can be done with the same ethos. That's been a fantastic way of demonstrating the biosphere in action. All the different projects that have come out of the Galloway Glens uh, are linked back to the biosphere and that wider ethos of engaging people in their landscape, their cultural heritage, uh, their natural heritage, and getting communities to actually take ownership and influence their local area. But you have then been able to concentrate with a sensible amount of funding on one landscape area. So you've been able to demonstrate what can be done. So you are the biosphere in action. Looking at the Kendi Valley as one of the seven river valleys that make up the biosphere, um, it's a perfect example of us trying to use that international designation uh, to draw funding and draw activity into the area to support sustainable communities in Dumfries and Galloway. I think what the Galloway Glens is fantastic at doing is it really demonstrates the biosphere in action. It really shows what the biosphere means, what difference it can make to local people, local communities, local businesses. Thank you, that's great. Now, welcome to you both. Welcome, Ed, and welcome, Joan. Thank you so much for coming tonight to join us. I think I'd like to first ask you, how did you set about fulfilling the criteria to set up this biosphere? And what was the catalyst for the whole project? I don't know who, who's going to answer that question first. I you. think Ed should answer that question. Yes, that sounds like a slightly technical question to me. Okay, Ed, can you help with that one? Okay, well, Polly, I mean, originally the the region did have a biosphere going back to the sort of 1970s when um, when the the Merrick Kells um, and Merrick and the Rinds of Kells and Silver Flow were the original designated biospheres which at that stage were very much focused on nature conservation and the study of those areas. Um, but in the sort of um, late 90s, along with the, the whole Agenda 21 and, um, and Rio, the whole concept of sustainability began to come on stream and looking at people as being part and parcel of that ecosystem. So rather than dealing with nature conservation in isolation, it was looking very positively at how people could affect that and could play a role in it. And so that, um, that, that sort of stimulated a big debate within UNESCO Biospheres, looking at how we could, um, how they could be redesignated to, to actively involve people. So that was the catalyst really in looking at biospheres across the world um, and reappraising them. And that led to the biospheres in Scotland being looked at quite heavily around about 2000, uh, the year 2000 that was, and they appraised all of the biospheres we had in Scotland. I can't remember exactly how many we had at that time, but I think it was five or six um, across Scotland. Um, and the, this, the Merrick and Rins of Kells biosphere was one that they, they felt could fit that new criteria of, of actually actively engaging with people. So that started quite a long debate then working with local agencies, local communities, beginning to explore what a biosphere could bring to Southwest Scotland. I, think I mean, I think the name biosphere is a bit um, misleading because when I said to a couple of friends this week, you know, I've been reading and going to be talking about biospheres, they said, oh, is that like the Eden Project? 
So I don't know why it ha it's a word that perhaps a lot of people still don't fully understand. Would you agree with that, Joan? Uh, yes, and I think, I mean, uh, the, the Eden Project thing always crops up. It's a bit of a red herring. But there's no doubt that the term is not a familiar one. It's not a term people are really familiar with, like they're familiar with, say, National Park. But actually, I mean, it's a scientific term, biosphere. It, and, and since this is a big bang weekend and, and we're focused on the planet, if you like, it, it just means the zone of the planet where life is concentrated. So it's just a distinction. Biosphere is a distinction from atmosphere and stratosphere and lithosphere. That, that's the scientific origin of it. And it's actually completely apt because this is a very thin layer which makes planet Earth very distinctive, at least distinctive in the unique in the solar system. And it's what we all depend on. So it's how, and, and man is part of that. It's not, if I had one objection to, to UNESCO, it's the fact they call it man and the biosphere. To me, man is part of the biosphere or mankind is part of the biosphere. But if you think of it like that, then sustaining a, that thin skin of life in a way that can support human societies is what sustainability is about and it's it's completely appropriate but it is a problem because it's a bit unfamiliar a lot of people don't understand it so how does the biosphere compare how does having that status compare to say having national park status is that really so far apart no i don't i don't think it is i mean ed uh, no uh, what you tend to find is that people who are you know, adhered to the ethos of the biosphere, probably supportive of National Park too. There's no, there's no conflict there, and there are many instances where national parks eh, and biospheres coexist and overlap. Eh, but national parks do differ actually a bit. I mean, national parks are not a homogenous group. There are different kinds of national parks. But certainly, you know, as you know, there's been a big campaign in this area for a Galloway National Park. And their aims are very similarly on sustainable development. What do you feel about that? Um, do you feel it's a good thing to have a national park? What do you feel, Ed? I, I, I don't see it as a conflict in any way at all. I, I think the two um, can operate, and indeed they do operate, both nationally and internationally, side by side. As Joan says, they have very complementary objectives. Um, they have a slightly different government um, sort of um, structure in that the, the National Park is a more regulatory model, uh, particularly because it brings in planning. So it has has more sort of rules about what, what is acceptable and isn't acceptable in a national park. Whilst the biosphere is much more about um, participatory governance. It's about bringing people around the table, looking at what the challenges and the issues are that we face and trying to find a way forward. And so in some respects, I suppose, I, I feel that that is perhaps more reflective of modern society of actually trying to gather in the opinions of people and working with people in how you take it forward. But really, as far as I'm concerned, I think both of the, of the, the two designations, what they're really doing is they're recognising the value of the natural, the cultural heritage that we have in southwest Scotland and the value of that and the fact that we should be investing in it to actually help to benefit the socioeconomics of the region at the same time. I mean, there is a problem that a lot of people just bypass in Bruce and Galloway, don't they? They go on up to the National Park in um, Loch Lomond or in the Cairngorms. Um, and you made an interesting comment about the development, you know, the um, planning and things is different in a national park and they're more careful. I have to say that I would strongly disagree with that if you see Avi Moore and um, some of the goings-ons that happen right in the middle of that national park. Um, it's not a great model. I don't think we're 
we're not like America where they really do actually stick to their, you know, the national park is a national park and, and you can't do things in it. Would your national park encompass the same area as the biosphere or would it be a different part? Would it have different boundaries? Well, I think there's a lot of debate within the Galloway National Park group as to exactly what the boundaries would be. Um, I, mean, I don't think any of that has been sort of finally agreed on by any means. It's still all up for debate. Uh, our biosphere, as we said in the video at the beginning, is based on river catchments. So it's looking at bringing together uh, the, the connections around the river catchments and how they benefit people. And you know, and, and I mean, to go back to the point about people bypassing Dumfries, I mean, that was one of the key reasons why people went for UNESCO biosphere status originally, in that the three local authorities of South Ayrshire, East Ayrshire, Dumfries and Galloway were looking at what can we do to put Southwest Scotland on the map. And they recognised that having the potential to tie in with this international accolade that was aligned to UNESCO was a way of, of effectively getting people to turn left at Gretna getting them to come down to this corner of Southwest Scotland and recognize that actually you don't have to go north of the central belt to experience Scotland, that the south of Scotland also has some really special and worthwhile sort of areas that are, you know, good for people to explore and experience. I certainly think from the, I certainly think from the local authority point of view, because I was a councillor in Dumfries and Galloway at that time, uh, I mean, the, the decision to go for for, Nash, for a biosphere, the, the new biosphere status, if you like, was kind of founded in, in a real belief that the quality of the environment, the quality of the countryside was absolutely an asset which should be used for sustainable economic development. I think, I think there was a really a quite strong a view that this our, our natural and cultural heritage were an asset that we had to use uh, for economic development, uh, which fits entirely with the UNESCO designation. And I think one of the things we have to remember, Polly, also is that, you know, this UNESCO biosphere status, you know, it's, it's international recognition. It's people looking in at what we have in southwest Scotland and looking at that on the, the international stage and saying that actually what you have in Southwest Scotland is internationally of value. And that's why that award has been made. So I think I think it's something that the region should be, you know, immensely proud of. It should be something that we really do talk up and we should be, you know, we should, we should be full of pride for the fact that people are looking in at us and saying that we are so unique, so special. Yes, I would agree with that. But, I mean, it's it's a. Do you have a big um, interaction constantly ongoing with people? I mean, obviously not at the moment, but normally when people can move around, are, do people come over to see um, your area and you go over to see other biospheres, or is it mostly verbal um, and over the airwaves rather than flying backwards and forwards? Oh no, I think I think one of the really exciting things about biospheres is this international network. This fact that we're part of a family of over 700 biospheres around the world. And, and it is a family. You know, we all share the same core objectives as biospheres. We, we often share a lot of the same challenges and issues um, around the world. So there's an awful lot of networking, of sharing. We, we do it online. We do it through meeting at conferences and we host visits. So we've had quite a lot of international groups coming over to see what we're doing in Southwest Scotland who are wishing to learn from us. So we, and, and likewise, we've taken groups out. So in, in recent years, we've, um, we've taken groups of businesses from our area out to Germany, say to look at the Rhone biosphere and to look at some of the work that they've been doing on labeling local food and drink and how they've been able to add value to that. Um, and looking at how that can compare to the approaches that we've taken within our biosphere on a, a similar sort of scheme. Um, but likewise, we've been very active in ecotourism, take, um, with visitors coming over to see some of the work that we've been doing with communities in places like Glen Trill um, on ecotourism. Um, so we've had people from Finland and from Norway coming to look at the work we've been doing there. And likewise, we've taken community and business representatives back from there to places like Finland. Um, 
you know, so there is there is a lot of, of international engagement, and I, I think that that's part of what makes the biosphere so exciting. It's looking outside at what other areas are doing and trying to draw in some of those ideas that we can use in our area. I think the learning part of the biosphere is really very important. I mean, the, the international aspect is something that's really, I think, pretty unique to the, to the biosphere uh, status. And I think we can learn a lot from other people. And I think we're doing some things that are, are, are pretty innovative, certainly in UK terms. Uh, but, I mean, the, the, the whole idea of the biospheres was not that they should just try to practice sustainable development in their own area, but that there should be something of a model which could test different approaches which were more widely applicable. So the whole learning and research element is really, really important. And, I mean, we are now getting quite a, a bit of research contact from different Scottish universities. But, and, and, and learning right down to, and I maybe shouldn't say right down because the school level is maybe the most important level, because it is all about sustainability for future generations uh, so you know the things that can be done in schools and with young people I mean some of our young people actually just at the moment I think Ed I would be right in saying aren't they are tuned in to a, a biosphere a youth biosphere network with Ireland and, and some other countries can you yeah, tell us well, a little bit more about the history of the whole biosphere movement? How did that all start? It, it came about in the early 70s, Polly, where what, um, what was being looked for was for different um, climatic and habitat zones around the world that could be used to monitor change that was going on. So the chief... Um, Nature Conservation Officer at the time for the UK was asked to identify a range of different sites um, as part of this big European-wide um, network and, um, and they identified a whole range of sites across the UK um, which as, as we started on at the beginning were very much for scientific study and research. They all tended to be designated sites of one description or another. Um, so a lot of them were Natura 2000, Ramsar um, type sites. And they were used for scientific research and, um, and, and for, for monitoring things like climate change, um, land use change, habitat change, um, biodiversity. Um, so that's really where they came from. And then as we were talking about before, it was the whole sustainability agenda that came on screen through the 90s that really saw biospheres then um, embracing people and, um, and looking at this bigger picture of their wider interaction with man. So, so that's kind of the journey they've come on. They, you know, at the moment, biospheres around the world are increasing in number every year. Um, so I think we're now up to 701, I think it, it is currently. Um, you know, but I, I think that, that today they're, they're they're a very current model for the challenges that we face in society. The whole sort of post-COVID green recovery type conversations that are going on are perfectly suited to the whole ethos of a biosphere. And as Joan was saying, you know, this whole idea of, of using them as test beds, as, as areas to pilot new thinking, new ideas, new initiatives, and hopefully from that to be able to roll them out into wider society. How are they? How is the biosphere funded? Right. Well, up until last autumn, we'd been absolutely uh, functioning on a shoestring. But at that stage, uh, up until then, we were basically being funded by the three local authorities. Uh, with some input from, uh, of course, this is where I use old terms, uh, 
Scottish Natural Heritage, Nature Scotland, and the Forestry Commission in one or other of its uh, manifestations, let me put it like that. Uh, but basically from the, the three local authorities who I've got to say, and I'm going to, uh, I'm really going to give them credit, uh, despite clearly being under a lot of financial pressure themselves, they, they absolutely stuck with us and gave us core funding. Uh, after that, like every other similar thing, you then you then fight to get some project funding. But the basic core funding which allowed us, and all it allowed us to do was employ two people uh, part-time, but that basic core funding at least kept us, uh, not just in the picture, but really doing quite a lot. And then, then the New South of Scotland Enterprise Agency came on board in the autumn and I actually have put funding into it and I, I, it, it's really very gratifying that they have seen that this is a real opportunity for South West Scotland uh, and our support is now. So that's why we're now in an expansion stage, if you like, of, of actually recruiting staff, etc. But that's where we've been. There's a very good question. There's lots of good questions coming in, and I've been sort of kind of um, using a few of them, but one in particular, uh, Adriana says, does the biosphere protect any particular species like the European Natura 2000 area? The biosphere itself doesn't because the responsibility for things like that sits with nature, Scott, within the designated areas. But what we do have is we have um, a range of high focus species and habitats that have been identified through our natural heritage management plan. So we have things like black grouse, we have golden eagle, we have golden plover, um, curl you. Um, they are all identified as high focus species that we work on. And we also work on the high focus habitats of blanket and raised bog, upland heath, purple moor grass and rush pasture, uh, montane heath, native upland oak woodlands, native wet woodland, acid grassland. Um, and we, we basically, we, we have a management plan where we then go out and we work with land managers, trying to encourage the kind of management habitat um, works that will benefit both those habitats and the wider species that are associated with them. And that's really one of our core focuses. I mean, Joan was talking about the SOCI funding um, that we've got from the new enterprise agency. And one of the key elements of that will be to grow our land use and biodiversity team so that they can begin to offer more of a service to land managers than we've been able to have with the one and a half full-time equivalents that we've been working with for the last few years. So that's going to be one of the really exciting bits, I think, over the next few years is actually being able to go out there to work with people and to really support them in some of the initiatives that they can be doing um, to benefit, you know, nature across the biosphere. Yeah, I, I worry quite a lot, you know, when I spend time in Galloway, that every time I go, there seems to be more and more and more commercial forestry and things like curlews and black game are really, and golden plover, are really, really suffering as a result of this. Um, ditto small rural communities. So how do you think we can address that? Because that is really a very major problem and that big forestry isn't really sustainable because they're taking the same crop time after time after time and it can't be right, can it really? It is, it is a huge challenge. I mean, some, something in the region of 28% of our biosphere is, um, it has woodland cover. And when you look at that 28% of woodland cover, forest cover, you know, over 25% of that is commercial forestry. Um, so just over 2.5% is, is native broadleaf. I think we would all like to see more native broadleaf um, across the biosphere. And I think we recognise as a biosphere partnership that we, we feel that we should have a much more integrated landscape that has much more balance and diversity across it, um, being 
open to just having a, a sort of single species, you know, Sitka plantations across, um, you know, such a wide area. Opens us up potentially to tree disease and, and issues around that. But we also recognise that there's a commercial value to that and that that is also helping to sustain, um, you know, some of the sort of forestry products there. We would like to see that timber um, being used in more high quality products so that it's actually locking carbon up more. But we, we do feel that at times perhaps, you know, government policy is a little bit simplistic on forestry and that actually it's much more nuanced than just planting more trees. It's actually looking at getting the right tree in the right place and making sure that it's, it's really going to make a difference um, and that as well as addressing climate change, it's also, a, a, you know, helping to address some of the biodiversity loss that we, we also suffer from in the region. Yeah. Uh, lots of good questions coming in now. Um, Vanessa, what do the local authorities expect from the funding that they give you? That's a I good think, question. I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. pick, up that up, pick up on that if you like it. Uh, I think the local authorities, as I said originally, I think De Vries and Galloway, and I think the other local authorities are probably the same, uh, Rural development in southwest Scotland has been very challenging. Let's let's really admit that. Uh, you know, we are a low wage economy with a <coughs> depopulation. It the rural economy in the southwest has really struggled. So I think the local authorities, probably, I shouldn't maybe speak for all of them, but I certainly think they saw the sustainable economic development potential. Of, I think that was, I think it. they could see that properly uh, cared for and properly marketed, this gave the products and the services and the tourism potential of the southwest a real boost so i think i i think that i think that really is the motivation and they have they have stuck they've stuck with us uh, through some fairly lean lean years and are really very well engaged i think there is also i mean it's interesting that these i think we are probably the only organization and the only forum in which these three local authorities come together. The Vries and Galloway has not historically worked closely with South, East, South Ayrshire and East Ayrshire. So just as our partnership board is, is kind of unique in bringing agencies and community representatives and business people together, it's also uh, some, they can challenge me if I'm wrong, but I think it's unique in bringing these three local authorities together. And as somebody for the western part of the Fries and Galloway, I think that's really quite interesting because, I mean, we have a lot in common, obviously, with Carrick and South Ayrshire. Uh, and, you know, East Ayrshire has its, well, it has its own challenges. And, and, you know, because it's got these old coal field communities with their own challenges. And I mean, this is, I think, maybe something else to stress about biospheres. It isn't just about looking after or in any way preserving what we've got. It's also, you know, appreciating that things can be better and that there's remedial work that needs to be done. So, you know, it's the way we can support some of these uh, coal field communities uh, and some of that more remedial stuff as well. But it's a, it's a unique uh, combination and it's, it actually is geographically quite challenging for the, you know, uh, communications, physical communications between the three local authorities are not that easy. Do you have a lot of farmers coming on board and keen to um, work with you? Are, are they keen, the livestock farmers in particular? Not as much as I would like to see, but I think this is a reflection, to be quite honest. Ed kind of hinted at that. 
because we have been so, uh, you know, restricted in what we had in staff, a lot of our emphasis in recent times has been working with businesses. I mean, non, not particularly land-based businesses. Farmers who are involved in in tourism, yes, uh, are, you know, some of them are very much in, engaged. Uh, but I mean, our emphasis has been on on business links, really. Certainly, in the last couple of years, I think it would be fair to say. Uh, but I mean. As we, as we all know, there are real challenges in farming and there are real challenges in where farming sits in the local community. And the relationship of the farming economy to the wider rural economy, all sorts of challenges. And I think the biosphere eh, approach is very relevant to that. I mean, the whole thing, local, local food chains, local food, eh, you know, is, is absolutely current and relevant. Uh, so, I mean, these are very much the areas in which we'll be expanding as we expand. Uh, I mean, I think that's uh, the, the value of local produce has really come to the fore in the pandemic because, yeah. you know, in the Aberfeldy area, all the little shops have come together and really come up trumps. And I really hope that people won't go back to the supermarkets. They will support local and shop local. But, I mean, meat is a big issue because there's been such a movement to um, encourage everybody to be vegan. And and that's wrong. You know, I, I, I'm afraid I don't approve of that because I think, you know, these small farmers need us to eat their fabulous um, slow grown meat. And I think it's the very big commercial farmers that have done a bit of damage. Would you agree? Well, I've got a vested interest in this. I don't know whether I, I don't know whether I should comment. All I'm going to say is a bit like a bit like your question about uh, afforestation. It's a question of balance, isn't it? It is. It, it it really is a question of balance, and yes, I I get very frustrated too. Uh, I mean, it annoys me that I can go and buy a piece of New Zealand lamb, but I can't go and get a piece of nice um, Galloway Galloway lamb reared out on the hill that is probably as as free of everything as it's possible to be. Yeah, yeah. Very annoying. There's a question here saying, why aren't the rins of Galloway included in the biosphere? Oh, that's that's historical, really, Polly. It was when the biosphere was designated, they took the view to base it on river catchments, um, which meant that they looked at the primary rivers that came out of the Galloway Hills, and they looked at the land that was directly associated with that river as part of the catchments. And it happened that there were no rivers that came from the, the Galloway Hills that go out onto the rims of Galloway. And so they were left off. Now, personally, I don't really agree with that. I think the RINs should have been part of the biosphere. And indeed, we had a study done a few years ago that also recognised that there was good reason to bring the RINs in. So next year, we have to go back to UNESCO. Um, it will have been a biosphere for 10 years next year. And we have to go back and we have to report back to them on what's called a periodic review where we have to tell them what we've achieved over the last 10 years. And that is an opportunity for us also to review our boundaries. And one of the things that I think we're all very keen to explore is whether or not the businesses and communities of the RINs would like to be part of the biosphere, because what we don't want to do is impose anything on anyone. But if there is that support from them, then we'd be really keen to look at how we can make a case to bring the RINs into the biosphere. Um, and indeed, probably at the same time, Stranra, because it would be ridiculous to have the rims and not Stranra. So I think there's a real opportunity there to, to, to kind of address that, if you like, which uh, I think was, was perhaps something that wasn't fully thought through originally when the, the boundaries were being decided. I've got a couple more questions here. I've got one from Rona. Is my mic reverberating? Um, one from Rona, I volunteer at Girvan Tourist Information Point, open when restrictions allow. What tips can I offer to our local accommodation and activity providers to enhance their eco-tourism offer? Sounds like she needs to get in touch with you, Ed, after this. 
Oh, well, absolutely. We, we've done a lot of work with businesses, quite a lot of work with businesses in the Govan area, actually, looking at how we can encourage businesses to become Biosphere Proud supporters. So um, a lot of our businesses, we have now, what, 175 business um, Proud supporters, which means they can sign up um, and they can do all this online um, to our Biosphere Charter, which is basically, it's the sustainability ethos of the biosphere. It's all about conserving the natural resources, supporting the local economy, um, promoting cultural heritage um, and local produce. Uh, it's on about sort of um, helping to contribute to health and well-being of, of local communities, encouraging learning, raising awareness. So we would encourage any business to sign up in the first instance to become a Biosphere Proud supporter. And in return, you'll get a certificate and you'll get a little badge that you can put up in the window that says that you're a Biosphere Proud supporter. You'll get a listing on our website. And I think it begins to show that you're associated with us. Um, I think what businesses then can do is they can take that on to another level. And again, a couple of businesses or a few businesses in the Gervin area have done this, where they can then become a Biosphere certified business, which is a much more onerous audit process that they go through where they they have to to give us written evidence and they get visited by our business development officer marie mcnulty or oh, certainly under normal circumstances they would and they they get audited for their sustainability credentials and it's it's quite a protracted process but they go through that process and that then means that they can actively label their products their services as having been certified by the biosphere. And it's a real way for them to, um, to add value, um, add kudos to what they've got to offer. And I think one of the really exciting things about them becoming part of that business network is that the businesses begin to network with each other and we facilitate different engagement, different, um, and at the minute during the pandemic, a lot of it's been online, but under normal circumstances, it's actually bringing people together physically so they can begin to learn about what each other are offering and to look at how by working together, they can offer more. Yeah. And I have to say, the work we've done was, was recognised by our Nature of Scotland, All right. of, which we, we won last autumn, um, following the work that we've been doing with those businesses. And it, it, it's, it's been a really successful way and the businesses really value it. So I would really encourage local businesses in Gurdon to do that and if they want to have first-hand experience in that area, then talk to Biosphere Bikes, who are based in Girvan, or the Adventure Centre for Education, both of whom have gone through that process, and I think we'll, we'll talk very positively about their experiences. I think this is, if you don't mind me, I can help as well, but I think this is really important. Uh, if, if, if sustainability is to mean anything, it has to mean it absolutely at grassroots level. It, has to, it, it means changes in behaviour and approach from communities and businesses and ultimately from individuals. It's all very well to talk in the abstract, but it needs us to, to change some of our habits. And, uh, I mean, the, the business certification is we're, we're the only biosphere in the United Kingdom that has gone down this road. We have learned a bit from, from others uh, in the continent, but we're the only biosphere in Britain that's gone down this road. And it's quite a challenging uh, procedure. It really is. But if businesses feel that... It's a business opportunity to show your sustainability credentials. And I think increasingly people, quite a lot of businesses probably do realise that. But this one, you know, in the case of the biosphere, it isn't just a token thing. This is fairly rigorous. <laughs> and uh, so I, I think it's, it's important from the point of view of, of getting real change where it matters. But I think it also, Ed was talking about the networking and what's unusual about this is that it actually cuts across different sectors. So, Polly, you were saying about farming. I mean, something I do feel as a farmer is that a lot of farmers are not terribly engaged 
with other types of businesses in the local area, if I can put it like that. And do you think they're suspicious, Joan? Do you think there's a sort of suspicion about the movement that maybe is just comes from a misunderstanding, or or do you think it's more complicated than that? A suspicion about the biosphere movement. Just in general, about being part of something else. Do you think there's no, a fear? I just think I just think, and this is nothing particular to do with the biosphere, but I just think the farming community under various pressures has become a little bit isolated and sectoral in its approach. Uh, we're all under pressure. We maybe don't yeah. have a lot of time. I know there are a lot of farmers that are quite engaged with their community, but I've felt for a very long time that the farming community was a little bit detached for the wider community. Well, I think they're very squeezed, aren't they? I mean, they, they really are. They are very squeezed in all senses. And uh, maybe sometimes a little bit on the defensive. But I think it's really important that tourism businesses uh, and producers uh, and other types of businesses uh, actually have networks where they meet together and see if they can use each other's products and benefit from each other. So, you know, I mean, we have accommodation folk that are really signed up to procuring, you know, what food they can locally or procuring other uh, services or goods locally. Uh, you know, even down to things like locally made soap and stuff like that. I mean, it is bringing, it's trying to bring this business network that goes beyond a sector of the, I mean, say I've also worked quite a bit, no, as a, a, not as an operator myself, but I've worked quite a bit various times uh, with tourism businesses and they can be pretty sectoral in their approach as well and only meeting each other so I think this is a big opportunity that we offer Does and that... I think one of the key one of the key parts of that actually is as Joan was saying is telling the consumer because I think all too often you know the consumer the visitor doesn't get told that their breakfast has local eggs or local bacon or local sausages and it's actually it's beginning to tell that story so one of the big things that we're doing at the minute is we're working with all these different sectors and looking at how we can develop our sort of truly sustainable biosphere experiences to so come and stay in our biosphere with a local accommodation provider where you can enjoy local food and drink where you'll be taken out by a local guide who really understands and knows about the local area to take part in local activities and and I think for us, that's what that whole sustainability message is about. It's about sort of that 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 sort of whole sort of um, supporting the local economy, um, about supporting and, um, and 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 sort of minimising the impact on the local environment um, and benefiting the local community. You know, it it has to be all in the round. It has to support all of that really for us to work. Because otherwise, I think that sometimes sustainability is a is a slightly banded around word that people it use without any real meaning to it. And, and you know, and for me, it has to have those three elements to it yes, to yeah. Yeah. The biosphere to really benefit everybody. There's another question about farming that's just come in from Candy, and it's uh, it's a bit of a thorny one. How does the increasing growth of intensive dairy farming in Dumfries and Galloway fit with the concept of sustainability in and around the biosphere? Can the two happen side by side? And I think, Joan, you'll have to have the job of answering that one. Ah, it's not an easy one to answer. No. But I mean, I, I'm certainly very, yes, yes, I, I'm, I'm very conscious that uh, the growth of very large, intensive dairy units in, in the lower parts of uh, the biosphere area is, a, is an issue, I think it is. I think all I can say from a biosphere point of view, we don't have, and nobody has actually, a, any regulatory role in this. I think, I think all you can do in this as a biosphere is try to facilitate other opportunities for farmers, if I can put it like that. Uh, you know, try and support alternative ways uh, of farming. And there is, 
you know, there's the whole regenerative farming uh, movement that's now get quite a lot of, of, of purchase. And I, I don't think there's anything more than we can do. I mean, at the end of the day, people have to have businesses which are financially sustainable. Uh, but there are surely different routes to that. And if we can be part uh, of a something that emphasises the different routes there are, whether it's along the lines of diversification, whether it's through government support, but then it, that needs government policy to support these things. We, you know, at the you end, your hands tied a lot of the time. You, people yeah. react, business folk will react to the opportunities and the policy which comes from government. That, yeah. that I think is the reality. Joan, as someone whose um, sons have come back to live and work in the area, what is your view on providing housing for young people, affordable housing? I mean, and is there a sort of provision for that in the biosphere or is that something you are aspiring to achieve? Well, this hasn't been, I mean, this isn't a particular topic that uh, we have been able to, to pick up. Uh, I mean, Ed can maybe say a bit more about this. I mean, clearly, again, there are, there are issues of affordable housing. Uh, there have always been, or for a long time now, been real pressure uh, from the whole second home market uh, and how difficult it is for, for local young people Again, as I say, it's a, a low-wage environment to really be able to afford their own homes. But, I mean, this isn't something to date we've been able to really get involved in. I mean, I don't know whether Ed wants to help me out on this one. Well, no, I mean, I mean, there's not a lot more I can say on that either, Joan, really, other than I think that what we, we would aspire to is that if we're looking uh, at, at sort of new social affordable housing in the area, it should be really sustainable housing. It should be housing that is super energy efficient so, so that it can begin to address some of the sort of challenges of fuel poverty that we have. But I also think that it's linked to a much bigger challenge uh, of, I mean, Joan mentioned there that we're a low wage economy. Well, I think we need to be looking at how we can actually, you know, facilitate or support, um, you know, better quality jobs that will be better paid um, as well as, as part of that fix. And can we use part of that green economy? Can we use that as a way of really sort of beginning to create new opportunities? Can we put Southwest Scotland on the map? as a region that is seen as being truly sustainable, where people want to come to, to live and work, you know, and through that are bringing in new jobs, new opportunities. Um, I can't help uh, the situation at the moment is going to really help with that because I think people are beginning to appreciate local and they're also beginning to appreciate that people who've been locked up, locked down in the rural environment seem to have fared an awful lot better than those who've been in big cities. I mean, I think we've all um, living, farming, living in the natural environment. It really is so much easier to keep uh, your head above the parapet yeah. um, than it is for poor people stuck in the middle of a high rise flat yeah. in the middle of Glasgow or something. Yeah. So I can't help thinking that that will help boost um, what you're trying to achieve. Do, would you think the same thing, perhaps? That might, it well, might I encourage think, more people to come? I think we evidence of that, Polly, absolutely. Uh, and, I mean, I think, I think actually what the whole COVID uh, experience has shown, I think more and more people realise that the natural environment is not just providing their physical uh, you know, their, their physical needs. It, it also very much caters to their mental needs uh, and their wider needs. I mean, I think that's absolutely... To what extent that will last, who knows? But uh, certainly, I think it has produced a bit of a difference in mindset. And it has also... also I mean, there's plenty of evidence of people moving into the area 
uh, yes, because they're, you know, provided they can get reasonable broadband connection, they are a bit more footloose and they see the advantages uh, of, of rural living and that's absolutely to be welcomed, as, you know. This, this is Wake Book Festival and Wake has benefited from people moving in with, with new ideas and initiatives. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's a very welcome development, really. And there's just such a wonderful, vibrant community in, in Wigton, which, you know, I would love to see more of these small communities revitalised. And it sounds like that's very much at the heart of the biosphere and something that both of you feel strongly about. Absolutely, Polly. I mean, one of the key initiatives that we run is a biosphere communities initiative where we go out and we work with communities and we have what we call a sense of place toolkit, which is a way of getting people talking about some of the fantastic things they have on their doorstep, whether it's the natural heritage, the cultural heritage, the way that their locality has inspired some of the amazing creative people who, who we have both present day and in the past who, who, who have lived in these communities. And we see that as a way of helping to raise pride and understanding. It often creates really sort of healthy conversation um, amongst different community members when you have somebody who's a real natural history expert talking about what's special about their locality that perhaps other people in the community weren't aware of. It really begins to generate a good buzz about it and begins to get people thinking about what's special about their area and inspiring them. And, helping to create greater resilience and making those communities stronger and better places yeah. so people can want to live and, and, and be based there. Well, we haven't well, really we're running, we're running out of time now, so we're going to have to wind up. But what we haven't really mentioned is that the biosphere encompasses the marine environment too, doesn't it? The coastal and marine environment. Is that right? Well, we, we, go, we go to the high tide mark. We don't yeah. include the, the marine environment. They can include the marine environment in other parts of the UK. Um, they certainly do. But for us, it's the high tide line is, is the limit. Um, so does that involve fishing communities? Absolutely, yes. Yes, yeah. all the fishing communities around that edge are, are certainly part and parcel of the biosphere. Definitely. So you've got an, an awful lot. It covers a huge amount of, of everything. Extraordinary. Well, I really have enjoyed chatting to you. And I think um, that you are promote you have promoted the biosphere spectacularly well. <laughs> it's quite something. Do you think there'll be a lot more of them in Scotland before long? Oh, I think so. I know, I know of at least two other areas that are actively looking at whether or not a biosphere would suit their locality. Um, and I think we'll see that there's more and more come on stream across the whole of the UK and indeed you know, wider Europe. Is there only other we one other in Scotland at the moment, of course? We have West at the moment, yeah. Mm. Only one more in Scotland. Is that at the West of Ross one? West yes. of Ross at the moment, but uh, yeah, I mean, it certainly is a, an increasing, increasing interest in the designation. And I think it's just because it's such a relevant and, and modern designation. I seem to be disappearing into darkness. Maybe. I know you are. Tell me, June, <laughs> both of you, would you encourage people to um, look for this, just to, to go through the work to become designated, or or what would you what would you advise them? As a region, definitely yes. I I, I, I think so. I I think, as Joan says, I think it's a really innovative approach to rural development. I think all it can do is benefit a region. I can't see any negatives that can be associated with the biosphere but it's really it's about what the the communities the businesses really want to make of their region and i think it's a way of bringing it together in a very positive form well thank you both so much for talking to us and for joining in with this event tonight it's been really great to hear you and i wish you all the very best with your ongoing work may i remind the audience that at 7.30 tonight, we have Christina McHale, who is talking to uh, Jessica Fox. And Christina is an emergency space doctor. So that is guaranteed to be an exciting chat. So hopefully see you there. Thank you very much. And thank you to our audience as well. Good night. Thank you. Thanks.